Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm John Hodge, joined by J.C. Abbott. Justin Dunk will return next week. Today, we're discussing G. Roy Simon making a bold prediction for the Edmonton Elks. Saskatchewan Rough Riders potentially being very active in free agency. What the Hamilton Tiger Cats might do with Dane Evans. Award-winning defensive end Lorenzo Malden re-signing with the Ottawa Red Blacks. And the CFL releasing some key off-season dates. But first... Bo Levi Mitchell signed a three-year contract extension with the Hamilton Tiger Cats on Tuesday, cementing him as the face of the franchise in Steeltown. What are your expectations for Mitchell and Hamilton, Hodge? I thought that our guy Josh Smith wrote a great column for Three Down Nation, published Wednesday morning an opinion piece about how it's Grey Cup or bust for Bo Levi Mitchell in Hamilton, this is a team that has not won the Grey Cup in 23 years. It's the longest drought in the league. I think it's double the next longest drought at this point. And to me, I couldn't agree more. And I'll also say this. I love that Bo Levi Mitchell uh, spoke to the media in such uh, positive language yesterday. Uh, I loved his comments about acknowledging the fact that he's a little cocky, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, he's got a lot of self-confidence and uh, I think that's something that the Tie Cats need. I think after Dane Evans crumbled a little bit in 2022, I think they need someone to step in there, be a leader, right, and and really step up and and take hold of that starting quarterback job. With that said, I've expressed skepticism regarding Bo Levi Mitchell over the past couple of years, dating back, of course, to his time with the Calgary Stampeders, and I'm going to do that again. Bo Levi Mitchell's earnings in 2022 maxed out at $485,000. Now, he did not collect all that money. Last year, he would have earned about four fifty dollars as a member of the Calgary Stampeders. He's getting paid more than that in Steel Town. Reportedly, he's making $520,000 in 2023. That makes him the second highest paid player in the league behind Zach Kolaris. And I looked up the numbers today, JC. I've mentioned it on this show before. Dane Evans actually had a higher quarterback rating this past season than Bolivar Mitchell did. Over the past two seasons, Mitchell has thrown 19 touchdown passes and 19 interceptions. In 2022, Dane Evans threw 19 touchdown passes and 19 interceptions. So Mitchell's last kind of two half seasons of work, virtually identical to the work that Dane Evans did on the field last season. Again, personality-wise, leadership-wise, I think there's a lot of different qualities. Obviously, Mitchell's a two-time MLP, two-time Great Cup champion. The resumes are different, but until I see the proof in the pudding, I'm going to be skeptical that Bo Levi Mitchell can truly elevate this team that much on the field in Steeltown. You've got absolutely right, Hodge. I don't know if I've ever been more conflicted in how to view a quarterback signing. Because normally when you have a deal of this magnitude, the importance of that position in football, it's a slam dunk, right? But Bo Levi Mitchell, the last two, two and a half years, or two and a half seasons, I should say, three years with COVID, both you and I have been at the front of the Bo Levi Mitchell is done bandwagon, right? He just hasn't looked the same since suffering some of those injuries, specifically that shoulder injury. And while there have been flashes, he looked all right early in this year. It's figured off. And I don't know if he can play at that high level consistently going forward. Now, we've seen time and time again in the CFL Older quarterbacks find success in new destinations, revitalize their careers, go on to great things. And that might indeed be the case for Bo Levi Mitchell. And I was in the stadium during that West semifinal when he came in in the fourth quarter against the BC Lions. And quite frankly, for those few snaps he did play, maybe looked like the best quarterback in the league, including Nathan Rourke. Some of those throws he made, I mean, the one down the sidelines, it was as good a throw as you will see anywhere in the CFL. So clearly that high-end stuff is there. But if it's not able to be delivered consistently, 
is he any better than Dang Evans was? Because we know Dang Evans had that high end potential. We saw what he did with that five touchdown game against Winnipeg, where he looked absolutely dominant, but he wasn't able to put it on the field every week. I don't know if the Hamilton Tiger Cats are going to get much bang for their buck if they're overpaying for Bo Levi Mitchell and he doesn't deliver in a way that makes him look like the Bo Levi Mitchell of old. Well, let's also remember the history here. Now, neither of us are based in Hamilton, but this is a team that over the last you know 20 years, dating back all through that tenure, of course, where they have not won a Grey Cup, Every couple of years, they seem to find a shiny new toy that's going to fix all of their problems. We saw that with Jason Moss under center. We saw that with Casey Printers coming back from the NFL. We saw that with Henry Burris. We saw that with Zach Kolaris. We saw that with all kinds of additions that they've made. High-priced free agent quarterbacks who seem to be the magic bullet, who are going to come in and make the Hamilton Tiger Cats the team to beat again. Ironically, the only time really over the past 20 years the Tiger Cats have been the team to beat in the CFL, it was with Jeremiah Masoli under center in 2019. Yes, Dane Evans took over that starting role partway through the season after Masoli tore his ACL. But it's ironic to me that a team that has gone out over the past 20 years and made these big types of splashes, the most success they've had, Arguably, the two quarterbacks they've developed themselves in Jeremiah Masoli and Dane Evans, by the way, both of whom they are either have already discarded or I think will soon discard in speaking about Evans. We'll get to him in a moment. One thing I thought was really interesting about Bo Levi Mitchell's address to the media on Tuesday was he talked about Scott Mitchell, who was in that team's front office, I believe is now technically a minority owner of the Ticats. Being involved in this process, obviously Mitchell's been around the Ticats through that whole 20-year tenure. Obviously, he has a role in this. We know Bob Young, the owner, uh, calls himself the caretaker. I'll call him the majority owner of the team. Also has an affinity for shiny new toys, right? He was someone who went out and got Kent Austin to be the head coach of this team Not long after he left the CFL after winning a great cup with the Riders in 2007. We also know that Scott Mitchell was apparently buying Bolivar by Mitchell drinks in Hawaii, he said, which was amazing. By the way, CFL scouting departments have been gutted over the last few years with their budgets. I hope that that drink that Mitchell paid for comes out of that scouting budget. It wouldn't be fair if he gets to just spend money and the scouts have to have to skimp whenever possible to make make the dollars work. Uh, But anyways, I'll say this. No one would be happier than me if Bolivar Mitchell lights it up in Hamilton. He gave a great quote yesterday talking about we're going to make the CFL fun to watch again. Yes, points were up in 2022. Yes, passing yardage has been up. But we all know that the CFL does not resemble, at least right now, the high-flying, open-ended game that we saw in the 1990s, back when I was a kid. And JC, I think you were still just a, a dream in your in your parents' imagination. We need the CFL to get back to that. And if Bo Levi Mitchell and Tommy Condell, the OC in Hamilton, can put their heads together and find a way to light it up in 2023 in one of the CFL's hottest markets... That's going to be a great thing for this league. Absolutely. No question. I'm just skeptical that we're going to see it, but I'm happy to wait and see how it plays out. Yeah, the league is better when Bo Levi Mitchell is playing his best football. So even though we harp on him, both of us want to see him succeed and and bring that star power back to the forefront because he is one of the, le- the the game's best characters, one of its best players when he's in his prime. And I think you mentioned one of the cautionary tales here when you're listing all those former quarterbacks that the Hamilton Tiger Cats have brought in, hoping they would be the magic bullet, and they haven't been. Well, one of the names you listed, of course, Zach Caleros, who was eventually struggled with injury, shipped out of town, and now look what he's become with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, right? Obviously, very different injuries he suffered than than those suffered by Bo Levi Mitchell. Different long-term effects for them. But if you're the Hamilton Tiger Cats, you're hoping to have that sort of salvage project. That you're bringing in a guy who can instantly, in your offense with Tommy Condell, slot right in, 
make you a contender, make you a winner, and put you over the top and finally bring a great cup back to Hamilton. And by the way, the guy they shipped out of town to make room for Zach Kolaris, Henry Burris, won an MOP and a Grey Cup after leaving the Tie Cats, right, as a member of the Ottawa Red Blacks. So this is a team that has a history of getting distracted with the shiny new toy and maybe maybe underestimating what they currently have. The other thing I'll point out, JC, that I think is worth remembering, as much as Dave Dickinson in Calgary has always spoke very glowingly about Bo Levi Mitchell, giving him a ton of credit for how he handled his benching this past season, I think it's important to remember that the Calgary Stampeders had absolutely no obligation to pick Jake Mayer. Jake Mayer is considerably younger than Bo Levi Mitchell. He's in his mid-20s. Bo is turning 33 this offseason. But there's absolutely no reason the Calgary Stampeders couldn't have decided to keep Bo Levi Mitchell and trade away the rights to Jake Mayer, just as they did several years ago by keeping Bo Levi Mitchell and trading the rights away for Nick Arbuckle. They got a first round pick back for those rights. So to me, clearly the Calgary Stampeders were still having tremendous respect for what Bo Levi Mitchell did for that organization, for what he is still potentially going to be able to do in Hamilton they chose to move on, and they chose that for a reason. So we'll see. I'm excited for it. This is going to be the most intriguing storyline, I think, in the CFL this season, particularly with Nathan Rourke now south uh, south of the border. So I am excited to see what plays out in Steel Town. Edmonton Elks Assistant General Manager G. Roy Simon expressed his optimism for his team in 2023, saying, quote, we're going to win, and I think we're going to win big. Close quote. Team President Victor Kui acknowledged in a, the challenges the Elks faced this past year, telling 630 Chad in Edmonton that he was shocked to see the team lose all 10 of its home games. What are your expectations for Edmonton this season? Well, I, I appreciate Simon putting all his cards on the table and making such a bold prediction. I'm not sure I'm quite as optimistic about the Edmonton Elks as he is, but consistently with Chris Jones teams, we've seen this second year jump. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for Edmonton to have this as well. And this will come down to maybe not the recognizable names in free agency that fans get excited about, but what their scouting job has been like over this off season, because it was pretty rocky at the start of last year. Jones was brought on, you know, later in the process, Simon coming in, they, they have a very short off season to make all the changes they need to. And, and as we know, with their sort of unique style, those changes continue to happen routinely. Weekly, they are cutting starters all of last season. Now they've got a full off season. They've had a full year to evaluate guys. And I think they've found some real gems. You know, Simon mentioned off the top Dylan Mitchell and Kevin Brown. I think both of those guys could be among the top players at their position in the CFL next season. If you look at Dylan Mitchell as a receiver, his numbers in, in the very small sample size he played, I believe it was only eight games, you know, 637 yards in that span. You extend that out over a full 18-game season, that production is rather incredible, especially given the fact that I don't have all that much confidence in Taylor Cornelius, who they have now tied themselves to at quarterback. You know, If they're getting just that level of quarterbacking production and Dylan Mitchell is able to put those types of numbers up with Kenny Lawler there and Daryl Walker there, you know, that's a pretty damn good player, especially as a rookie. So I have high expectations for him going forward. I think where the biggest changes are going to need to come is on defense. And they're going to get some guys back from injury that are going to help. I mean, Aaron Grimes is the big one. Missed all of last season. You can plug him in. They've already signed Luchez Purifoy. Uh, but there's going to have to be some other fines there, Hodge. And that's going to come through the scouting department, which Chris Jones has traditionally been able to find diamonds in the rough, those gems that other guys miss because of how much work he does pounding the, the pavement down south. But it's by no means a sure thing, especially with two other leagues down south looking for talent. 
The Edmonton Elks are set to draft second overall in the 2023 CFL draft behind the Ottawa Red Blacks. Both teams finished 4 and 14 this past year, and they had identical records at home and on the road. Both went 0 and 9 at home, 4 and 5 on the road. At first glance, it might look like these two teams are even, but though Edmonton, it's worth noting, did have a harder schedule, I did the math the other day. Ottawa was minus 95 in point differential over the course of this past season, meaning their average game was about a five-point loss. Edmonton's net point differential was minus 245. They are, that like their average game was about a 12-point loss. Like this team, it's not just that they were bad. Like they have a very long way to go. Now, when you look back at Chris Jones, 2016, he goes into a situation in Saskatchewan where he guts the roster, famously right releases John Chick and Weston Dressler on the same day. That team won five games that year. The next year, they go ahead and they make the playoffs. They came very close in 2017 through the East Division of actually making it to the Grey Cup in that East final game. They narrowly lost to the Toronto Argonauts. Ironically, now on Edmonton, James Wilder Jr. making that great third down catch late in that game. To me, this team does have some reason for optimism. I will say Luchez Purifoy is a great addition. Aaron Grimes, who missed all of last season, you highlighted JC, is going to help secure that secondary. I also think they they were wise to move on for Duran Carter at this point. I think it was clear last season, with all due respect to Duran, who, who was a very good player in this league at one point in time, no longer had that Duran Carter magic that maybe he possessed five years ago. By the way, 2017. Easily the best career or best season of Deron Carter's career in Saskatchewan with Chris Jones. So to me, I, I love the the fire. I love the the confidence that G. Roy Simon has in his team. I think Taylor Cornelius, you hit the nail on the head there, is the number one factor of how this team is going to play in 2023. Is Stephen McAdoo going to be able, their offensive coordinator, to get a season out of him like he got out of Cody Fajardo in 2019? Taylor Cornelius and Cody Fajardo, at the end of the day, have very similar skill sets. Taylor Cornelius is a little bit bigger, but he is just as mobile as Cody Fajardo, arguably more mobile. I think I really underestimated that personally going into the 2022 season, just how well Taylor Cornelius ran. I believe Taylor Cornelius finished top 10 league wide in rushing this past season. And that's not just among quarterbacks, that's among everybody. And I also think he finished atop the Edmonton Elks rushing totals for the year. Now, is it optimal to have your franchise quarterback leading your team in rushing? No, just ask the Buffalo Bills about that and how that works out when you're playing cold weather football in the postseason. But obviously, as Victor Cui, their president said, this team needs more butts and seats. We don't know what their financials look like until they release them as a publicly owned franchise, likely in May, certainly later in the spring. But it's probably reasonable to assume at this point, looking at the sparse crowds that they have, that this team will be very lucky to break even. If not, they're going to have lost money this past season. So we talked about having, you know, Bo Levi Mitchell playing at the top of his game and a great team in Hamilton is being great for the CFL. I think it would be great for the CFL as well to have a much more competitive team in Edmonton in 2023. And that second overall pick I mentioned probably won't hurt either, especially if Edmonton loses some Canadian talent to the NFL, though we'll talk about that later in the show. And just for context on the financial side, last year, uh, Edmonton posted a, a net operating loss of $1.1 million. So I would suspect that we will be in a similar realm of losses after this season, especially with the decline of attendance because the team hasn't won a home game since 2019 and and both is that historically long in terms of days and we've all heard the numbers last season of over a thousand and it'll be well past that by the time we actually get playing games this year but a pro football record for the longest consecutive home losing streak anywhere nfl or cfl that is truly remarkably horrendous and there needs to be more talent on that defensive side of the ball, in my opinion, to change it. You know, 
The other name that that got brought up during uh, our own Justin Dunk's conversations with Elks management at the CFL League winter meetings, which I was a little surprised to hear, but uh, Chris Jones mentioned Daniel Ross, the defensive tackle that he brought over from the NFL who missed all of last season with injury as another guy in the the realm of Aaron Grimes that he wants to see back because he believes he can make an impact as a pass rusher, which was really an area that they struggled last season with the exception of Jake Ceresna, who they've already re-signed. Now, Ross has had a cup of coffee in the CFL with Chris Jones before jumping down to the NFL, playing a, a number of seasons as a rotational defensive lineman. Uh, we don't know what we got, what what they have in him. We know how much they're paying him, which, as as you well know, Hodge, is well above what you would bring in an unproven American defensive lineman for. But clearly, they are high on his potential as well and his potential impact next season. But there will have to be other pieces that they find, guys that they uncover through this this season scouting process. They need someone to be able to rush off the edge because right now they don't have a ton of pressure coming there. They need somebody who can play cornerback. It's great to have Ed Gangy and Luchez Purifor and Aaron Grimes, but all of those guys, it's going to be interesting to see where they slot in because you've got Scott Hutter at safety and Enoch McConzo was playing Sam Linebacker. Do you move him to Will and take Adam Kohar off the field to put Purifor there? Or did you try to put Purifor at safety and where you put Hutter? Like there are some key pieces that you have to figure out in, in where you're going to play these veteran guys. And right now, there are gaping holes at the corner spot. So there is still a lot to figure out in Edmonton before I have any confidence predicting how many games they'll win next season like well, G-Roy Simon does. And, and that's fair. I will point out with the holes at defensive end and corner, this is also a team that traded away Thomas Costigan and Nafis Lyon last year, which raised some eyebrows. Also talking about the injuries, because Chris Jones did talk about injuries. Yes, they had a lot of injuries in Edmonton this past season. Aaron Grimes, obviously being gone for the season, was a a big detriment to that club. But two of the players they carried on six game all season long, Wesley Apollon and Gavin Cobb, were Canadian rookies who might have bright futures, but were unlikely to be major contributors as rookies in 2022. And this team also had more healthy scratches on their one game injured list than any other team in the league. This is a team that carried Malik Tyne, Dion Lacey, Toby Antigua, uh, Thomas Jack Curdola, a bunch of players as healthy scratches for long points of the season. And they also scratched. It's funny to remember this now. They, they, made Taylor Cornelius a healthy scratch the first three games of the year as Nick Arbuckle started with Trey Ford backing him up. So while injuries were a factor, I don't think they were particularly a factor in Edmonton the way that maybe Chris Jones was trying to paint it a little bit. I think that they had a pretty standard number of injuries, not not necessarily different from all the other teams in the league, but we'll see. Credit to Chris Jones. He turned the Riders around in two years. Let's see if he could do the same with the Edmonton Elks. Speaking of those riders, Craig Dickinson told the sports cage on CKRM that the team has to make improvements to the roster through free agency. Do you think the riders will be active when the market opens on February 14th? I don't see any way where they can afford not to be, to be perfectly honest. I was looking today at their roster, running some numbers I've highlighted six players here, JC, that at least if I were the riders, I would be prepared to move on from. One of them may be an exception. Five, I would certainly move on from. That list is Mike Edom, Jamal Campbell, Shaq Evans, Dan Clark, Duke Williams, and Cody Fajardo. Dan Clark, I'd probably take back because he's a local guy. He did get hurt last season, but he's still he's still a very good center. But if they don't bring him back, those six players combined would be a cap savings of approximately $1.3 million. We're talking about essentially a quarter of the cap that can be freed up from those four players alone. And if you're freeing up $1.3 million, you can certainly afford to make some noise. And let's also take a quick look at this list. Mike Adam, I think it's been a very good defensive back in this league, but I think he's. it's clear that his best days are behind him. He's a 10-year Canadian vet. You could probably go younger 
at safety, whether it's Godfrey on Yekka, whether it's Jaden Dalkey, they've got some options there. Jamal Campbell was paid a lot of money coming over from Toronto. I think to secure that right tackle spot, he never won that spot. I don't think it makes sense to bring him back. Shaq Evans and Duke Williams were very disappointing this past season. Yes, injuries were a factor in that, but obviously I think that team needs to revamp its receiving core. And then for Jardo, of course, we've talked about that at length on this show Dane Evans reportedly, our own Justin Dunk has said, is likely to be the guy for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders under center. And guess what? You don't have to pay Dane Evans almost $500,000 to be your starting quarterback. You just have to wait for the Ticats to cut him, and then you can sign him maybe even to an incentive-laden deal. Again, we'll talk more about Evans in the next segment. But to me, this is a great opportunity for the Riders to find an influx of talent. Obviously, the offensive line needs to be addressed. That was probably their weakest spot this past season, particularly at the tackle spots. But outside of that, you've got a lot of money to play with and, frankly, a roster that could use to get a little bit younger. I don't have Larry Dean on this list. He's a pending free agent. He was great last year, but he's 34, right, starting a weak side linebacker. If this team is serious about improving in 2023 and turning a new leaf, be active in free agency, go out and use that money to sign some younger guys, and not only inject some talent into your roster, but maybe bring about a bit of a new culture there because that team seemed to get awful stale awful quickly over the course of the 2022 season. It really did. You look at this list, and it's pretty clear that the Raggers need to go and find a receiver for next season because, as you've mentioned, Duke Williams was getting paid a boatload of money for not a ton of production and a lot of other issues that we've talked about, obviously, the helmet-throwing suspension, the penalties while he was injured. Uh, I don't think you can you can bring that back if you want to bring – build the culture that you're trying to build in Saskatchewan in order to turn this around. And then Shaq Evans himself, you know, has said he's, he's probably not going to be back in Saskatchewan and he is disappointed over the last two years. He's a guy, you know, when we sat here a year ago, Hodge, we looked at the Riders roster and I was high on this team because I thought their receiving core was going to be extremely dangerous with Evans and Kyron Moore and Williams and Keon Schaefer Baker and the rest of their Canadian contingent that is also talented. I I thought they were going to do great things. I thought Kogi Fajardo was going to have a strong season with those guys all around him. And it just didn't turn out that way. And not all of that is on each of them individually, but there has to be a change. And I think you need to move on from some of these high-priced guys and find something new in that receiving core. And and you may need to find multiple pieces because we still don't know about the NFL future of Keon Schaefer-Baker, who's had 12 workouts, I think is surprisingly not signed at this point. He may never sign, but if a deal comes for him late in the NFL, an opportunity, you're going to be left without your best pass catcher too. So there needs to be some movement on the receiver front. I know a lot of Riders fans are going to be raising some eyebrows of why I talk about the receivers and not the offensive line. And the reason why is I don't know if they can improve that through free agency Hodge. There's just not a lot of talent out there, unfortunately. And that's the reality of the world we live in when it comes to offensive linemen. I mean, the best guy who might have been on the market when you look at the initial pending free agents lists, I thought was Zach Williams in in Calgary, but he's already been re-signed. You're going to get a bunch of guys hitting the market that other teams probably aren't that high on who may not be an improvement over what you already have. And yeah, sure, you need to take shots and and try and find any way to improve. But really, it's going to take quality scouting and a lot of time to build an offensive line in this day and age because there is a dearth of offensive line talent right now in the world. Every league, NFL, CFL, XFL, USFL, they are desperate, desperate for offensive line talent. There's not enough good guys going around that can play that position, particularly at tackle. And you'll see guys making NFL practice rosters that CFL teams wouldn't have signable grades on because the situation is that bad. They are looking for traits and they're that that desperate for offensive linemen. So if you're a Saskatchewan Rough Rider fan and you think next year there will be a dramatic turnaround on the offensive line and they can fix it all in one go, you know, set your expectations a little bit lower because the only way to fix this offensive line is through scouting 
and through building cohesion as a unit. And, and sometimes that means keeping guys together, even when your first instinct is to move on from them. Well, let's talk for a moment about where else you know, you could potentially put that money. If there's no marquee tackles who are set to reach the free agent market, which right now, from what we've seen, you're, that's a very astute observation, JC. There isn't a blue chip offensive tackle that you can go out there and add. The only one that I would potentially look at is Derek Dennis, who I thought was very good. I was very skeptical, frankly, going into 2022 that he would still have it after sitting out for two years. Unfortunately, got hurt late in the year, suffered a broken leg, but I thought he was very good up to that point. The issue is Derek Dennis signed with Saskatchewan back during the Chris Jones era and went from being the league's most outstanding offensive lineman to having what was probably his worst year as a pro. He refound his all-star level of play in Calgary after returning to the Stampeders, but his year in Regina was certainly a down year. He got moved into guard that season, which when you get signed as a prize left tackle and you get moved into guard, that speaks volumes about how the team views you. So maybe they go back down the Derek Dennis train, but you never know. Um, to me, if I'm the Cal- or pardon me, if I'm the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and I've I've got a new OC in Kelly Jeffrey, who was the running backs coach last year, a guy who banged the table for a guy like Frankie Hickson. Right? We just saw Jamal Morrow have a breakout season. To me, this is a situation where you go, okay, we're going to be conservative on offense. And we're going to look to turn the ball over like crazy on defense. You go out, you bring back Anthony Lanier along the offensive line. You bring in a stud pass rusher like for Falara and Arimilade, maybe even a guy like Sean Lemon on the other side. How would you like that? Pick the pockets of two uh, or one of your, your biggest rivals in the West division, taking both of their defensive ends. And then you look to, to upgrade elsewhere. So to me, there's lots of options for the riders, but yes, they need to be very active in free agency, and they might be the team that's best able to do that based on who they are potentially moving on from. And and again, it's a team that could stand to get younger. Duke Williams is going to be 30 by the time next season rolls around, and all the other guys on this list are already 30, who I mentioned. So a good opportunity to get younger, cheaper, and possibly better all in one shot. Dane Evans, we've already talked about him like three times on the show, is due over $450,000 this season in Hamilton, making it clear that the team will not be able to keep him on the roster alongside Bo Levi Mitchell. Head coach and president of football operations Orlando Steinauer indicated on Tuesday that a decision regarding Evans will be made in the, quote, near future, close quote. What do you think will come next for the four-year veteran? Well, he's going to be moved on from and I suspect he ends up in Saskatchewan one way or another but here's the problem with Dane Evans and that $450,000 contract and this is a little insider uh, scoop here he doesn't have an off-season bonus including into that so he many players will get money on February 15th or, or January 15th a chunk of money which we often hear of players gigging hot before an off-season bonus, and and that's their purpose, right? Either you get paid it and the team is committed to you and you're likely there for the whole season, or if you're a guy who may be on the fence, like Dane Evans is more than on the fence, right? It incentivizes the team to cut you or release you before a certain point. It creates pressure in order for them to make a move to put you in a good situation before free agency so you can have whatever destination you'd like. In the situation of Dang Evans, there is absolutely no pressure on the Hamilton Tiger Cats until f- until training camp opens when he has his report and pass bonus to do anything of that nature, right? They don't have to move on from him quickly if the right deal's not on the table. They don't have to cut him if Saskatchewan is not coming with a good enough deal for a trade uh, at this point in time, right? So he could be strung along for as long as they like until they get to training camp. And if you're the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and you see that, and there's not going to be a ton of competition for Dane Evans' services, I don't think, in terms of people willing to pay a whole boatload uh, in terms of, of players and picks in order to make them a starting quarterback because most of the other teams are set. Well, why? On your side, wouldn't you wait and try and get that price to go down, right? To put more pressure on 
the the Hamilton Tiger Cats to potentially release him so you can sign him to whatever deal you like on your end. It's going to be interesting in my mind how that plays out because I think we know where the pieces will land, but how it's executed over the next couple months will be really fascinating. By the way, quickly going back to our last segment, breaking news, the Calgary Stampeders have signed James Vodders, who won a great cup with the team in 2018, had a bunch of sacks over two years at the club in 17 and 18. To me, that means that one of their two bookends, Sean Lemon and Falaran Oribalade, will be going to free agency. You're not bringing all three of those guys back. So to me, that is a great opportunity for Saskatchewan or any team looking to upgrade their edge rush. Uh, Getting back to Dane Evans, I'll say this, JC. The current deal that Dane Evans has is not tenable for any club, right? Coming off the season that he had, I don't think you can realistically look and say, okay, let's give this guy, you know, almost bully by Mitchell money, you know, that that standard now that has been set of, of, you know, 600,000 for Kolaris, over 500,000 for Mitchell. To me, Dane Evans is probably worth a deal somewhat close to what Vernon Adams Jr. signed in BC you know, $150,000 or so in hard money with incentives, right, taking it up to potentially that $450,000 mark. Because obviously, if Evans goes out next season, throws for 5,000 yards and 30 touchdowns, he deserves to get paid, right, that top-tier quarterback money. But he's probably at this point of his career needing to earn that, shall we say, rather than be given it right up front. So if I'm the Saskatchewan Rough Riders or frankly any other team looking to sign Dane Evans, that kind of accelerated deal with those built-in incentives is probably what I'm looking to sign. Right now, that's not what his deal is at all for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. You highlighted the offseason bonus, JC. By the way, for any CFL players or CFL prospects listening, rule number one, get a CFL agent. Not an agent who kind of sort of does CFL stuff. Get a CFL agent. They will not steer you wrong. People who are not vested in this league might not necessarily give you the best advice. Little PSA there. Um, But regardless, Dane Evans, I think, will end up in Saskatchewan. Though it'll be interesting to see, right? Because we know that he's been very comfortable sharing those starting duties with Jeremiah Masoli and Hamilton. Last year, he shared them at times with Matthew Schiltz. If Dane Evans does want to kind of reignite his career, so to speak, if he's not, you know, or, pardon me, if he's willing to sign a deal like I've described with a bunch of incentives put inside of it, you wonder if maybe, you know, Chad Kelly, let's say he's the starter in Toronto, is Dane Evans a, a good fit for a number two there? Is he a good fit for a number two in Ottawa, right? Where where Jeremiah Masoli is the starter. Those two have worked together brilliantly in the past. There's a ton of places. BC would be another one. Calgary would even be another one where suddenly they need a new backup quarterback in Cowtown. I think Dane Evans would potentially be very wise to go to a situation like that. Though, if he wants to get paid the most and be a starter, Ryderville would appear to be the best place to go. The only exception I would say is if Trevor Harris makes a shocking turn and signs with the Riders in free agency, all of a sudden, of course, there is a starting job available in Montreal, which who knows? Maybe that's a better fit for Dane Evans. For a guy who didn't seem to like the pressure of being a franchise quarterback, I know at least I would rather play in Montreal and Saskatchewan because Ryder Nation is intense and they'll know when they they'll they'll let you know when they love you and they'll let you know otherwise. I'll just say it that way. We have definitely been on the receiving end of both of those sides of Ryder Nation, Hodge, you and I. Just a word to the wise to Dane Evans, because I know he came out (laughs) with a couple of posts on social media uh, yesterday after the news came out with Bo Levi Mitchell basically expressing that he still has faith in himself as a starting quarterback and, and more power to him. But the phrasing he used in one of his posts was, I am optimistically delusional, which just for the record, Dane still means you're delusional. So maybe that's not the best (laughs) phrasing to use when saying you believe you can be an effective starting quarterback in the CFL. Just, just a little advice. I mean, I'll give credit to Evans more than you. Uh, yes, he there's he used the word delusional. That was his choice. But to me, any professional football player, to some extent, to have success at that level, needs to be delusional. You are making the active decision to put yourself in harm's way from 300-pound men 
whose entire job is to hurt you. And you're going out not just to dodge them, but do like phenomenally athletic things while doing that. So I think, yeah, you have to be a little delusional. Just like Bolivar Mitchell said in his press conference on Tuesday, right? He's a little bit cocky, a little bit this, a little bit that. You have to read the article Justin Dunk wrote. I don't want to put words into Bo's mouth. But he didn't use the word delusional, but I think it's kind of a similar avenue. You have to have an unprecedented level of confidence to be successful in the pro football ranks. Otherwise, you're going to shrivel up and die. So I, I give a little – Evan's a little more credit than you, JC. Write that down. Quarterbacks must be delusional. That's the key for success at the pro level. I think so. And Tom Brady's talked about that before. Even when he was a sixth round pick coming out of Michigan, he talked about, I I just told myself I was the best quarterback in the NFL, even though nobody knew who he was. And he was, I think the second or third stringer behind Drew Bledsoe, a former first overall pick. So a little bit of self delusion when it comes to the pressure that is associated with playing pro football, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. There are other professions where I think delusion is a really bad thing, but this particular profession, I I don't think it hurts. It's now time for Hodges' heritage moment. On this day in 1998, I've got two of these today, by the way, defensive lineman Harold Hasselbeck won his first of two Super Bowls with the Denver Broncos. The native of Amsterdam was raised in British Columbia and spent four seasons with the Calgary Stampeders from 1990 to 1993 before a seven-year stint with Denver. He remains one of fewer than a dozen players to have won a Grey Cup and Super Bowl. Also on this day in 2021, Scott Milanovic resigned as the head coach of the Edmonton Elks. The three-time Grey Cup champion accepted the position in December of 2019, but never coached a game with the club due to the cancellation of the season in 2020. Milanovic left Edmonton to become the quarterback's coach of the Indianapolis Colts in 2021 and was replaced by Jamie Elizondo, who lasted only one year in the role before being fired. JC, who's the bigger story? Hasselbeck? Or Milanovic? Oh, that's a tough one. Now, Hasselbeck is before my time, so I can't really weigh in on him. But in terms of his career, it was certainly very impressive. One of those guys who I think is among the most underrated CFL to NFL stories ever. We talk about the big name quarterbacks. We talk about a lot of guys who have had success. Harold Hasselbeck had as good a, an NFL career as almost anyone who's come from this league. And we don't talk about him Almost at all. But Scott Milanovic obviously was a huge story just a couple years ago, him going down. I wonder who got the worst end of that bargain. I know Scott Milanovic is getting paid well. The Edmonton Elks had to deal with Jamie Elizondo and all the disaster that followed. And Scott Milanovic, the poor bastard, he had to deal with the Indianapolis (laughs) Colts quarterbacks. So I don't know who came off worse than that. I'll say this. Milanovic, I think, deserves credit for being the only head coach in Edmonton Elks history to never lose a game. <laughs> Undefeated. He, his team never even trailed under his wow. guidance. That is, Pure that is remarkable. I will also say regarding Hasselbeck, I think it's neat, right? We've, we've kind of been sold this narrative that, and I think in many respects it is true, but this narrative of, oh, being a Canadian or, or, or being a former CFL player, it made it impossible to get an NFL look for so long. We're just now starting to see these guys get an opportunity. Well, Harold Hasselbeck from the early nineties is over here with his hand up. Now, granted he was six foot six and 280 pounds, which, you know, is, is pretty rare to find, especially back then, but he had a very good NFL career. He had over 17 sacks, four forced fumbles, 154 combined tackles, and he played for seven years. The money then wasn't what it is now, but he still, I'm sure, made a, a lot of money as a member of the Broncos. And how do you argue with two Super Bowl rings? Going back to back in the NFL is is extreme. I mean, it's hard in any league. It's extremely tough in the NFL, 32 teams. Um, so credit to him. And yeah, I'm glad we got a chance to talk about Harold Hasselbeck because I, I agree, JC. He's an unsung type of guy. It's time now for the three-minute drill. Here we go. UBC offensive lineman Theo Benedict has been selected for the East-West Shrine Bowl. Is he a worthy selection? He is absolutely a worthy selection. I see a lot of Dakota Shepley, who's down there in the NFL right now, in him, another UBC right tackle. It's going to be interesting because he can go in this upcoming NFL draft. He could have opportunities south of the border, but he's also declared 
he's not in this upcoming CFL draft. He'll go back to school and said instead a very unique circumstance for Theo Benedict where he's accepting opportunities from one league, but not the other. The Ottawa Red Blacks signed defensive end and ranging CFL most outstanding defensive player, player Lorenzo Malden to a one-year contract extension this week. Is that a good move, Hodge? I think it's a good move for both sides. He has entered Willie Jefferson territory, according to my sources. Willie Jefferson is making two hundred thousand dollars this season at Winnipeg. Jake Ceresna, I think, got two hundred five, and Edmonton Malden is right there with them. So I believe those are the three highest paid defensive linemen in the CFL. The Edmonton Elks re-signed veteran defensive back Ed Ganey. Do you think the thirty-two-year-old still has gas left in the tank? I think he does at this stage. I mean, we harped on the Edmonton Elks earlier in this podcast. We harped on them a lot last year in their horrific defense. You know who was not a guy we talked about a lot, despite the fact he was out there for all 18 games? Ed Gain. He sort of went under the under the radar, had a solid season. I think he still has value in the CFL. Canadian offensive lineman Sage Dockstager has signed with the XFL's Houston Roughnecks. Is he a big loss for the Toronto Argonauts? I think this is a big loss for the CFL in general because it's one thing when Americans go choose the XFL over the CFL, but when a Canadian player, right, born and bred in Ontario, Sage Dockstater chooses the XFL, I think that limits the Canadian talent pool, which as we know, just given our population as a country, is already much smaller than the American talent pool. It is a loss. The CFL unveiled its list of off-season dates, including the Combine for March 22nd to 26th, the Draft on May 2nd, and rookie camps opening on May 10th. Which are you most excited for? Well, you know I love the Draft, Hodge, but I am definitely most excited for the Combine because it means I get to see you in person. There you go. That's, That's nice. That's nice. The Calgary Stampeders have brought back Jonathan Moxie on a two-year contract extension. Is he their best defensive back? I think he is. I think Jonathan Moxie is criminally underrated. All due respect to Trey Roberson, I'm taking Moxie all day. The Montreal Alouettes have re-signed all-star defensive back Wesley Sutton through 2024. Do you think he'll be an all-star again in 2023? I think he very well could be. He had some struggles early last season, but turned it around. I thought he had some really good games down the stretch. I'm very high on Wesley Sutton. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers signed Canadian offensive lineman Tui Eli to a three-year contract. Is that a surprise? This is not only a surprise. It is a shocker. Ellie was a highly touted player out of Hawaii, quit playing football before he was draft eligible, got drafted, started playing football again, was suspended at the end of the 2021 season because he was unvaccinated against COVID-19, didn't play in 2022, and is now back for three years? Like, this guy has essentially moved on from football twice. He's he's giving Matthew Gerard a run for his money. If you don't know who Matthew Gerard is, that's a very niche joke. Please Google him. I think he retired from the CFL four times. Edmonton Elks defensive tackle Jamin Pelly has declared for the 2023 NFL draft. How can a CFL player declare for the NFL draft? So Jamin Pelly came into the CFL through last year's supplemental draft, which, ha- which happened after the regular CFL draft because he applied for a special exemption after he already left Sewell. He only played one year at the University of Calgary. Uh, was not eligible for the NFL draft at that time. He had to wait a year and declare once he's already in the CFL. It's happened before with a couple of of American guys who have come up early after uh, flunking out of college and things like that. It's a very rare circumstance, but one that happens occasionally. And Pelly is going to get some interest just because of how absolutely massive he is as a person. Winnipeg has re-signed Mike Miller, the league's all-time leader in special teams tackles. Is that a good move? It is a good move because Mike Miller is great. That said, Winnipeg needed to get younger this offseason, and so far they have failed to do that at every turn. At some point, you have to get younger. Otherwise, all your guys get old at the same time. I think Blue Bombers fans should be a little bit worried about that. TJ Lee. 
BC's longest tenured player signed a two-year contract extension with the team on Wednesday. Is he still one of the best defensive backs in the CFL? He is. I mean, he certainly looked like it at the start of last season. I think he trailed off a little bit towards the end of the year. Even he might admit that. But he is still a very effective defensive back, a leader on this BC Lions team, which is going to be super important going into next year because they've lost their other longest tenured player in Brian Burnham. TJ Lee is going to take on a huge leadership role next year on that defense. The Ottawa Red Blacks are in need of a new defensive backs coach after Alex Suber left to take a job at his alma mater of Middle Tennessee State. Is he a big loss? I think Suber is a very good assistant coach. I know from my days back as a Winnipeg Blue Bomber season ticket holder, I once asked Brad Foddy, the club's equipment manager at a, at a locker room sale. This is back in 2010. I was such a young pup. I didn't have any gray hair back then. It was still brown. And I said, who is the nicest guy on the team? And without skipping a beat or hesitating for a second, Brad Foddy said, Alex Suber. Um, he's somebody who I think has a great reputation for a reason. And congrats to him for the new job. But I will say, as a CFL you know, issue, we've now seen several assistants leave for not even like high level college jobs. It's one thing to become an assistant at Alabama or, or Clemson or Nebraska, but to have guys going for, you know, leaving the CFL for what I don't want to say it, but lower level college jobs, that to me is a red flag. And another reason why the operations cap needs to be raised dramatically and pay these good coaches to keep them in our league. Toronto Argonauts backup quarterback Chad Kelly said in a radio interview that he would, quote, love to play in Saskatchewan, close quote. The Grey Cup hero is under contract with Toronto for next season, but is there any chance the Riders make a trade for him? Look, Kelly's under contract. The Argos want him back. I think they would be foolish to trade him to Saskatchewan. I really do. I think he is a guy who could be the quarterback of the future there. But if McLeod Bethel Thompson comes back, Kelly is not going to be overly happy with taking on that backup role again. I mean, the amount of stuff he's done in the media this offseason tells you that. He's on the New York Post talking about, I'll take any path, USFL, XFL. Well, he's under contract for another year. That's not going to happen. He wants to start soon. If he starts making noise in the Argos dressing room because McLeod Bethel Thompson's back and he's not happy, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Toronto looks to get some value for him for a team that needs a starter. And right now, Saskatchewan is the best spot to send him. One quick note. I said that those three, Jefferson, Ceresna, and Malden were the highest paid defensive linemen in the league. I think A.C. Leonard in Saskatchewan is due more money this season, though. We'll have to wait and see if he restructures in Ryderville because he is coming off a little bit of a down year. On that note, we thank you as always for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast. Again, Justin Dunk will be back next week. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday.